you hear it okay back there? Everybody? Yeah. Robbie, you hear me? Okay. This uh, time frame here, Strategic Air Command 55 to 65, that's when I served in Strategic Air Command. Unprecedented amount of time. Normally a tour of duty in those days was three years, two years, and you went to another airplane or another place. But when you were in Strategic Air Command, it was a different story. I served a third of my career in one place flying one airplane. Highly unusual. That's the SAC logo, Strategic Air Command logo. A fist of strength offering a, a aggressive nation, your choice. A bolt of lightning or a olive branch of peace. And our motto, peace is our profession. I graduated from the University of Pittsburgh in 1954, second lieutenant, U.S. Air Force. Went to pilot training that summer. They had a two-track system. I got in the fighter pilot side, flew jets, and in 1954, there were many people flying jets in the military, and uh, I was proud of that. But on graduation, only the top 10% got their choice of assignments, and it wasn't a good time for fighter pilots. Korean War was winding down wasn't a big call for fighter pilots, so the rest of us were thrown in a hopper for the needs of the Air Force. And they said, you know, you'd be lucky if you get a flying assignment. So when I got my assignment, I said, first transition composite group somewhere in Salina, Kansas, flat in the middle of the U.S., a place called Schilling Air Force Base, and uh, it didn't sound like a flying job to me. I got out to the base, and it was a sprawling, it was three miles to the headquarters squadron from the uh, Entry point. And I got there and they said, uh, well, welcome, Lieutenant. I don't know what we're going to do with you. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're assigned to the 379th Bomb Squad. And I said, what's that? He said, they're getting a new B-47 bomber. Well, that was a big morale boost because that was the fastest, newest airplane, the biggest contract since World War II. Uh, this bomber was being built in Renton, Washington at the Boeing plant and 80 miles down the road in Wichita at the big Boeing factory. They were building 2,000 of them. And I thought, man, I'm gonna be flying the fastest, newest airplane in the system. So they sent me down to the squadron. Uh, they were very nice to me. The squadron commander said, uh, I don't know what I'm gonna do with you. <laughs> and I looked around the room and everybody I saw was a lieutenant colonel, a major, a captain. I was the only lieutenant in the, in the building. And there's a reason for that. When the Air Force fields a new weapon system, they have what they call the initial cadre. And they put their best people, the most experienced people. And these guys were all had thousands of hours of flying time. They were all World War II veterans, Korean veterans. And uh, I was kind of a novelty. And he said, well, they were very nice to me, but they weren't letting me near a B-47. And I became the laundry morale officer of the squadron. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did the supply account, inventory the supply account. I audited the dining hall. Uh, I was duty officer, officer of the day. I, mean, I, was, I was the ensign pulp of the outfit. This went on for about a month, and one day the division commander came down. He was on an inspection, and he says, who the hell are you? <laughs> and uh, I was sitting behind a stack, but I never saw it. I called him before, and I leaped out of my chair, and squadron commander company said, well, he's our admin officer. And boy, that was the end. He said, no, wait a minute, you're six pilots short, and you got this guy sorting papers. I'm thinking, I like this guy. Next day, I'm in the checkout program. So then from then on, I got into the B-47s. Uh, let me have that flicker stick here. Thank you. Sorry about that. Is it working? Let's look at the next slide. Can you do that for me? There he is. Gentlemen. Is this is a tough looking guy or what? This was my boss when I first got into strategic air command. He engineered the uh, Pacific Air War toward the end of the uh, fire bombing of Tokyo, the dropping of Hiroshima, Nagasaki atomic bombs. So he was a natural to lead strategic air command. Now he's kind of underrated in uh, the way of commanders go in my book because let me tell you what his task he was. He was to build an elite force so formidable that it could take a first strike with everything the Russians had, the Soviets had, and still respond in one blow to win the war. Now think about that. That's a tremendous responsibility. And the fact that he made it great is, well, we're all sitting here today. 
and I'll show you how we did that with my help. As uh, see if I can get this to work now. I'll, work. I'll do it. Here's what he had to work with. He had this brand new airplane coming off the assembly line, the B-47. He had the uh, atomic bomb, and so did the Soviet Union. And his mission then was deterrence. This is a Boeing B-17, B the best we had in World War II, a Boeing B-24, the Boeing B-29. Uh, this airplane was the peak of uh, development in air power. 200, 250 mile an hour airplane could go to 20,000 feet with a full bomb load. Some of you flew that along with the B-24 and the B-19. These were the best we had. Uh, they were manned by a crew of 10 or 11. Each one a specialist in his duties. You had pilot, co-pilot, navigator, bombardier, flight engineer. And uh, about this time, 1955, the great actor Jimmy Stewart had a movie called Strategic Air Command. And he was flying, he kind of playing himself because he was a World War II uh, bomber pilot in B-24s in Europe. And he was flying around in these propeller airplanes in the, in the movie and they brought him into this hangar and they said, we're gonna show you the future of aviation now. And he came into this darkened hangar and they slammed on the lights and uh, there was this airplane, the B-47. And it looked like no other airplane in those days. This thing looked like it came from outer space. Six engines, you see the plastic canopy with the two pilots sitting in the nose, the bombardier, six engines. And the reason it's called the mother of all jets because every time you step on an airliner, they can trace its DNA back to this airplane. The way the engines are slung under the wing for ease of maintenance and if you had a catastrophic engine failure, uh, it wouldn't damage the airplane. The Brits found out the hard way they put the engine in the wing of catastrophic results. Well, they got the airplane built on the drawing board and they said, my God, we only got room for three guys. This thing's a quantum leap in technology and complexity. There's only room for three people, along with this big bomb that it was scheduled to fly with, the one that dropped on Nagasaki. I'll show you that in a minute. So they had a pilot, we never called him a pilot, his aircraft commander. He ran the show. Co-pilot and the nav bomber here was one guy. Now that radio operator, flight engineer, gunner, defensive systems operator, and celestial navigation all fell in the co-pilot. The hardest working guy on the plane. And as soon as the airplane got airborne, he would stow his control column and manipulate all of these systems. This is what it looked like in the airplane. Wow. Yeah. You see the navigator bomber here in the front. He ejected downward. The aircraft commander under the plastic canopy, there's the co-pilot. And what the co-pilot did, right after takeoff, he would stow his column. He did not do much flying. He would insert a celestial uh, sextant through the canopy port so he could shoot the stars for the navigator or the sun lines when navigated by celestial. He could rotate his big barber chair 90 degrees to the left and have the defensive, defensive systems in operation where he jammed the radar. He had a, a chaff dispenser system that put out the little tinsel you know, that screwed up the radar. And if he rotated 180 degrees to the rear, he had the uh, system that controlled the guns, the cannons on the tail of the aircraft. There was a small crawl space that went back from the navigator's position to the bomb bay. It will probably will work now. Think so? Yeah. There's the cannons in the rear of the aircraft, the only armament it had because of the fastest airplane there was at the time it came out. Anything was ever going to catch it didn't come from the rear. You notice the underside of the planes, all the B-47s are painted white. That was to reflect nuclear radiation. Okay. When I got down to squadron, I found out the very strict structure they had. They had three levels of crew proficiency. The select crews on top, the lead crews, and the ready crews. It took me a year and a half to get to the bottom rung of the ready crews, R. You had an R number, R06, R07. They were the, most of the crews were ready crews. The lead crews were instructors. They were more experienced, and they instructed people uh, to get to the various stages of proficiency. And then the top, the cream of the crop, were the select crews. They were the flight evaluators. They determined whether a co-pilot could upgrade to aircraft commander 
or uh, through the system. General May, with that tremendous responsibility, got everything he wanted from Congress. I mean, all he had to do was say jumping and said how high. We got the best of everything. We had our own promotion system. <coughs> Much to the chagrin of the rest of the Air Force, he convinced Congress to take 900 promotions, lieutenant, colonel, major, and captain, out of the regular promotion system of the Air Force and give them to the Strategic Air Command. And every six months, the promotion board would meet, the wing commander would have his crews listed from one through 50. That was called the commander's preference list. And he would be handed maybe 10 major slots, eight lieutenant colonels, 15 captain slots, and he would start with those top crews, that number one crew, Everybody that was eligible would call you in and your captain and say, congratulations, you're a major today. You pinned on the rank and you got paid for it. As long as you stayed on that crew and in that proficiency, you didn't funk a check right or have a bad bomb, you kept the rank. So every six months, we had an exciting time. It was called the spot promotion system. Never saw anything like it in the military before or since. The rest of the Air Force didn't appreciate that. Training was intense. We had RVS sites, we had bomb sites. I bombed New York, Chicago, Denver. Uh, every city had an RVS site, radar bomb site, and they would score us electronically on our bomb runs. Uh, we would call in our crew number R06, where altitude, airspeed, and so forth, they would put it on a computer and give us a bomb score. In the late 50s, the Russians developed surface to air missiles changed the whole ball game. Now we had a high altitude bomber that could fly to 40,000 feet, practically worthless. So we had to develop a whole new program. Now our penetration had to be at 100 to 500 feet and 400 knots. That was the only way we could survive over the Soviet Union in case of war. Brought everybody down now to the low level. Took the RBS sites out of the cities and put them out in the pastures because you couldn't fly over Chicago. 400 mile an hour at uh, 100 feet. <laughs> this is a B-47 on takeoff. You see the black smoke, uh, that thing's not on fire. That's water injection. Uh, we used that on every takeoff, it lasted about a minute. Right before takeoff roll, the aircraft commander reached down, hit a button, inject water into the engines. Gave us about a 10% boost in performance. The pink smoke you see flying off there is the rockets. The rocket assisted take off 33 rocket bottles attached to the rear of the fuselage. We only used that on occasion. We had one bomb that weighed 17,000 pounds, and we needed a little boost to get off the runway. But you fired those rockets at 50 knots, and it instantly went to 100 on the airspeed indicator. The biggest boot in the butt you'll ever see, and you just hang on. All that stuff quit after a minute, and uh, it got real quiet. But uh, it was uh, the engines were very good, very reliable, but they were first generation engines. It was a difficult airplane to land. Land at a very high speed, higher than your airliners do today. And we used, uh, you can see here also the bicycle landing gear under the van. We didn't have tricycle gear, we had the main gear in a line under the, under the fuselage. Those little outrigger gear just to keep the outboard engines from drag. The small chute you see is a drag chute. Because the engines were so slow to accelerate, if you're coming in for a landing with the throttles back, some guy drove a truck on the runway, it would take forever to get the, uh, acceleration. So they developed the drag chute, the smaller chute you see, to deploy that in the air. And that would require a real high power steady to drag that along. So that if you had an emergency go around, all the co-pilot had to do was flick a switch, you drop the chute off, and you just have a boot in the butt, your power all the way up. That's the way we solved that problem. On landing, we deployed the large chute. As soon as the plane was firmly, firmly on the ground, aircraft commander called for chute, and that big brake chute would come up. Because without that, we'd go off the end of the runway. And you're sitting in your airliner and you hear that big roar after a touchdown and you feel yourself going forward. That's thrust reversal. He reverses the thrust of the engines forward and helps to break the aircraft. That wasn't invented yet. And airplanes were very streamlined and had a very high speed, so we had to use a brake chute. Beautiful airplane, the prettiest airplane I flew in, 42 airplanes I was qualified in. That's what was the most beautiful plane. You can see the clear plastic canopy on top. Here's a formation flight. See the thin wing. All the fuel was in the fuselage. The aircraft was limited only by the endurance of the crew. This is an air refilling operation with a propeller airplane in the front, 
delivering fuel to the B-47 in the rear. That propeller-driven airplane's going as fast as he can go. The B-47's going as slow as he can go. And what I mean by that, he's on the verge of a stall. And I'm talking about an aerodynamic stall. I mean, pilots very little here. I'm not talking about an engine stall, but when you're at a speed where you lose your lift, the airplane becomes uncontrollable and drops out of the sky. It takes about 5,000 feet to recover till you get the air going over the wings again and get your lift back. So it's a precarious maneuver. And we had to go down to his altitude in his environment, always in the weather and at night. It was a real bear. I took this picture from the front seat when I had an instructor in the rear. Here you see the uh, contact made with the boom coming from the tanker. There's a man laying on his stomach up there directing that boom into the slipway door and he's transferring fuel. Uh, and again, the airplane is just walling, the B-47 is just walling here. Control movements are very large. It's a physical endurance thing to do with the propeller wash is coming over and the noise is horrific. And if you're doing this at night in weather, very difficult. There are lights on the bottom of the airplane that say forward to, back to, forward up to one and try to give you direction. If you deviate seven degrees from the center line, it'll automatically disconnect and you're gonna drive back in again. About halfway through the refueling, we'd have to request a descent because you could have to go faster because we're getting heavier. And we would start down to give the tanker some more speed. Uh, not a happy maneuver. The toughest thing I ever did in an airplane. Then we were saved by the KC-135 jet tanker. This is the 400 of the Boeing 707 airliner, the first airliner. Now we can refuel at our environment, flying at 300, 400 knots, and uh, the airplane was really responsive at those speeds, and we were up at our altitude, we didn't have to go down and come back up again, so that was a big break. A little history on atomic bombs here. August, uh, an older gay dropped a little boy, that was Paul Tibbetts. That was an Iranian bomb, killed 100,000 people right away, and uh, flattened the city. Japanese did surrender. A couple days later, boxcar brought Fat Man, a plutonium bomb. Now, Fat Man was the airplane, the, the, the bomb that the airplane was designed to carry. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. It's a plutonium bomb. Nagasaki wasn't the primary target. He was diverted due to weather. He missed his aiming point. A gross error in our terms. Still killed 40,000 outright flat in the city. A plutonium bomb, a lot easier to make, a lot more effective, so the Air Force decided to go with plutonium bombs, okay? That's what we're making. Here's a picture of the bomb that ended the war. When I went to atomic bomb school, and very few people had seen an atomic weapon, I, I couldn't believe the size of this thing. It was huge. And it could be set for an airburst or a ground burst. And we took the thing all apart and learned how to fix certain malfunctions and so forth. We wore a dosimeter around our neck to record our exposure to nuclear radiation. And uh, all of our medical records were stamped with a red triangle, as was our wife's wife and children, because they were given special uh, consideration, any kind of alcohol problems or emotional problems and so forth. So they kept pretty good track. This is the version that we flew with, a little bit more streamlined. The way this worked, the navigator on the secondary filling on the way to the target would crawl back through the bomb bay, take the plutonium core off the side of the bomb bay, open two spring-loaded doors in the front here, shove the plutonium in on a rod, unscrew it, slam the door shut, and get an atomic bomb. 17 to 22 kiloton, 22,000 tons of TNT equivalent. That's what they are. The problem was always to escape the blast. High altitude release wasn't a problem, but now that we were driven down to low altitude, how do you fly over a target 100 feet off the ground and escape a nuclear blast? Well, the first thing they designed was the pop-up maneuver. You fly in at our low-level altitude, pop up to 18,000 feet, release the weapon on a parachute, go down the other side, hell bent for leather, and hope to escape the weapon. The problem with that was you were at your slowest over the target area, which was a heavily defended, you were a vulnerable person. Then we went to the last maneuver, the toss bomb, where we could throw the bomb out away from us. We're gonna to try to show you that in a minute. And uh, eventually, by the time the Cuban Missile Crisis, we had the lay down bomb, which we could fly over 100 feet, drop that sucker out, and be gone 10 minutes later and tick off. Nobody could stop it. Boom. We used blast curtains inside the aircraft because we would be blinded by these things, and the only thing open was the one screen in front of the aircraft commander. 
both pilots were given an eye patch, so that if you got one uh, eye blinded, you could switch it to the other. It's kind of bizarre. <coughs> but we could take three bursts and still have one eye left from the airplane. <laughs> That's strategic air command. Sack train <laughs> The Cuban Missile Crisis, remember they put the missiles into Cuba, the Russians did? JFK was a president and said, get them out of there. We set up a blockade. The Russians had ships on their way. This is what I had in the Bombay when I was deployed to a civilian airport, Detroit Wayne International Airport. This replaced Fat Man. This is called the Force Multiplier. Now you have four weapons. And this is what Rocket Man in Korea is heading for. He's trying to miniaturize that weapon. And you can imagine what kind of a rocket it would take to shove that fat man all the way to Los Angeles. You get a warhead this size, it's a lot easier. So I remember distinctly that far left was the first bomb out. That was to uh, the Moscow Air Defense Command headquarters in Moscow. And the second one was for an airfield. And the last two were for ICBM sites. I was sitting on the end of the runway at Detroit Wayne International Airport, waiting to see if the Russian fleet would cross the blockade or fire the blockade. If they did, we were off. They turned around. They blinked. This is a B-47, upside down, 60 tons. This is an airplane built to fly at high altitude, straight and level, on its back at 10,000 feet. Let's see if we can show them. Wow. This, uh, this is the Taz Paul maneuver. Let's see if we can get this to work. I've killed the sign on this because the guy, the narrator, has no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> but I'll talk you through it since I've done 20 of these maneuvers. You got the wrong one there, Chief. That's the wrong one? Yeah, that's a B 52. <laughs> Before that, there it is. There it is. Sir, thousand feet now, four hundred knots. Disregarded this guy. Here we go, pulling up two and a half G's from a thousand feet. There's the G meter in front of the aircraft commander, looking at the back of the airplane. Now we're going to go up to ten thousand feet. Just prior to the vertical, we release the weapons. Not after the vertical, like he shows. Come on, buddy. Okay. Here we go on our back. The bomb's going one way. We're going the other way. This is the most critical phase of flight. Some guys tried to roll out here. This is the, the controls are not very responsive. You have to keep pulling, pulling the Gs through at 10,000 feet until you get about 20 degrees below the horizon. You get 20 degrees below the horizon. Roll the aircraft out. Now, hell bent for leather going back down to earth. The airplane's headed down to 1,000 feet now, trying to escape the blast. Leveling off, there goes the bomb, it's going one way, we're going the other way now. Level it a thousand feet, <laughs> navigator, boom, we got a blow. What a maneuver. I did that 20 times. <clears throat> okay, we the next one, yeah, let's see if we can get off of this thing and get back to the regular show. Thanks, good job. Yeah, back up on the last maneuver, there we go. Okay, now let's see if I can go over the next one. There we are. Of course, all this was pretty costly. These loss rates are unacceptable by today's standards. This is more than a 10% loss rate in training, not combat. 10% is unsustainable in combat. So I lost three friends in Vietnam in combat, and I lost 12 friends flying a B-47. It wasn't a forgiving, air, forgiving airplane. The mission then, we had a 15 minute alert warning from NORAD. If the Russians came over with the uh, ICBMs, they would come over to Canada and come down and get a 30 minute warning. The 15 minute warning was driven by their submarine <coughs> off the East Coast because NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command, they're the ones who track Santa Claus, you know, and they track the ICBMs and they said we had 15 minutes. So we had to get our alert force off in 15 minutes. We did that with seven second intervals on takeoff. And in home alert, we pulled seven days on, three off. And during that seven days, you'd get at least two alerts. Where you'd fly out to the airplane, jump in the seat, start the engines, navigate and co-pilot, copy the message, and tell you whether you were going to go just to engine start or to the first refueling. You didn't know. So 
really a heart starter at three in the morning to get out there and scramble in the airplane. Overseas, we started to go and reflex to these bases all over the world then. That was a three week tour. You go over there for a week on work, a week off, and a week on. During that week off, you don't want to make it with some military transport anywhere you wanted to go. You want to go to Athens, you want to go to Paris, uh, you got to go wherever you wanted to go. And at the time I was a bachelor, six of us had a villa rented off the Spanish Riviera, the island of Mallorca. I'd open up the shutters and there's the Mediterranean down below me. It was a great life for a bachelor for a while. We went to these bases, uh, six RF bases in the USAF, and all of the SAC bases took turns at these places, so you got to see the best and the worst. And three bases in Spain, two in Morocco. That's in North Africa, in case you went to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> Alaska, two bases, and Anderson Air Force Base on Guam. That's what it looked like. It just shows you how much closer we are to Russia and how much we confounded the enemy's uh, targeting problem. This is the SAC Moho. This is a <clears throat> picture I took last summer on one of our reunions. This is the Moho at Shelling. No longer an air base, it's now used for a uh, first responders training base, but it's called a Moho because it's all underground. This is right at the end of the runway. We had our sleeping quarters, our, our dining hall, our rec room, our weight room, everything we needed in this place. It was good for an atomic blast within a thousand feet. Still survive. And many stories underground. If you Google SAC alert facility, you'll see them all over the country. They're indestructible because they're atomic bomb proof. The tubes running out of here are so that you don't have any stairwells. So they get that middle of the night alert. You can run out. Airplanes are sitting right here. It's right at the end of the runway. Here's an abandoned one. It shows you the tubes coming out where everybody would scramble out from the airplanes. This is what the mission looked like then. If you got the go code, you'd have a first air refueling just off of uh, Hudson Bay. Secondary refueling just after Greenland. Just prior to the early morning, you descend to low altitude uh, for entry into Russia. And our recovery bases, we had secret agreements with the Scandinavian countries and Norway, Sweden. And uh, uh, we would recover up there. We knew that tankers wouldn't be there anymore, and our bases in the U.S. would be destroyed. Because remember, they get the first strike. And, uh, our really men used to kid us would be the only survivors of the nuclear holocaust because the prevailing winds and the fallout would be sticking up there in the same way. And of course, in Russia. Cuban Missile Crisis we went to cock pistol. 130 B 47s went to 32 civilian airports. And uh, I was one of those. Uh, some of my friends went to Memphis. And we knew right away when they say cock pistol because I had practiced approaches to the truck when I knew we had a real car for the boats. We'd have the beer uh, uh holiday in taken over by the US but just appropriated. And that's uh, that's the way we did it. B fifty twos were still in production but we had a bunch on airborne alert. And this is what the lineup looked like. We had fourteen hundred bombers, the Soviets had hundred and sixty and forty two ICBMs. On October 28th, we had 6,300 megatons to deliver to Russia. So being a rational enemy, the generals went to Khrushchev and they said, turn the fleet around. And that's why they blinked. Everybody was interested. The height of the Cold War, we had 2,100 B-47s, 744 B-52s. Today, look at this sad thing. We have 157 bombers, about half of them in commission. Every one of those bombers would qualify for an antique license plate at the DMV. <laughs> Well, the end came for me in 1965. Uh, I took the last B-47 out of Shilling to the Bone Yard. That's at uh, Davis Mountain in Tucson. If you ever get there, it's a nice tour. They have all the airplanes in storage there, various stages of uh, some of them they refurbish and bring back in, some of them they use for parts. That's the B-47 fleet, but you won't see any B-47s because uh, due to a disarmament treaty, every one of them is chopped up in little pieces by a guillotine so there are no more than 47 standards. And that, folks, is how the West was won. Any questions? <laughs>
the mission to uh, Anderson Air Force Base, taking off from Shelly, I remember it was about 12 hours. And none of those crew members could see each other. And you couldn't get up and walk around either. Yes, sir. When you started out in your training in the aircraft, actual training for the yeah. flight, did you start out as a navigator and then go to co pilot? No, I started out as a co pilot. It took me a year and a half to get, by the time I got my top secret clearance, gunnery school, uh, aircraft system school, and everything, to get to the bottom rung, uh, it took a year and a half. And, uh, <coughs> How long did you get to captain? To get the aircraft commander, it took uh, another two years, and by the time I left, I was a flight examiner, I had 3,000 hours in the airplane. Hey, General. I've been, I've been promoted to major twice, and demoted to captain. <laughs> After I went through aviation cadets, I <clears throat> went on to uh, bombardier school yep. in Sacramento. And when we graduated out of there, uh, we knew each other real well. The first guy to buy the farm was in a B-47 at Forbes, I believe it was, on takeoff. Now you were in SAC and you knew all about B-47s. Do you remember that accident? He uh, was a bombardier. I remember a lot of accidents, but I remember that one. Too. Okay. <clears throat> this would have been in... Uh, most, of our, most of our accidents, our problems occurred from bringing the airplane down to low level. Uh, we were doing things in the airplane it was never designed to do and 